Hello everyone, my name is Andrew Keeler, uh, and today we'll be discussing the topic of linazolid therapeutic drug monitoring uh, and why it can be a useful tool um, to keep help keep uh, patients safe. Um, and I'm, I'd be interested, I, I wish I had a polling option because I would ask everyone here um, whether or not we, uh, everyone here is aware that this is something that we could do to increase our patient safety. And my guess would be that not a lot um, of people would be aware of this. Um, I certainly wasn't before I started this, um, and I don't think it was something that I learned in, in school, um, but it's definitely something I think important. Um, and even if we don't institute drug monitoring, I think it's something um, to just keep in mind. Um, I'd also like to thank Megan Wimmer, um, the content expert for this presentation for all the help um, that she provided to me. All right, so my three objectives for today are to ensure that everyone here can outline patient specific factors um, that can alter linazolid exposure, identify patients that linazolid therapeutic drug monitoring could benefit, and then also recommend linazolid dose adjustment based on therapeutic drug monitoring parameters. So let's first start with a little background um, on linazolid and then also why we're, why we're talking about this today. So linazolid is used primarily to treat uh, pneumonia as well as skin and soft tissue infection caused by gram positive organisms. It does have susceptibility against common multi-drug resistant pathogens, including MRSA, BRE, tuberculosis, as well as nocardia. It has 100% bio bioavailability with, aha, with a high tissue penetration with the volume of distribution around 40 to 50 liters, um, and it also has excellent penetration into the CSF as well. It is uh, removed both by hemodialysis as well as by the kidneys, both at about 30%, um, and it does not undergo any SIF and vitamin metabolism. However, it is affected to some degree by uh, P glycoproteins. So adverse events associated with long-term therapy, and I'm shown here, all of these adverse events are dose dependent, um, and they also increase the longer the therapy is continued. So thrombocytopenia, which is the most common long-term adverse event, which has incidence anywhere from 10 to 100%, and depending on the literature, um, can occur as soon as one week after therapy is initiated. Well, the peripheral neuropathy, optic neuropathy, and lactic acidosis. Lactic acidosis usually takes longer to occur, usually on the magnitude of, of months. Um, so those are generally much less common to, to encounter. So ultimately, what is the issue um, that we're going to be discussing today? So Currently, the FDA um, does not recommend any dose adjustments based on a person's weight, height, age, gender, renal, hepatic function, really any patient-specific factors. Um, and this came from a small study of about 24 otherwise healthy patient, uh, patients who were given one single dose of a 600 milligram tablet of nasolid. After that, they um, got serum levels taken at varying points after the dose, um, and they were then compared against one another. And based on the renal function of the group studied, um, the FDA concluded that there just wasn't sufficient enough evidence to say that renal function or any of these other factors has any effect on total linazolid exposure um, to any mean. However, more and more studies have been coming out investigating what the total exposure of linazolid in patients um, with reduced kidney function, um, and what that actually means. So we can see um, that this assertion by the FDA is not the case, and certain patient factors do play a part in the overall, overall exposure. Um, so this is clinically relevant, um, as indicated by the graph, I'm shown on the screen here from a study done in 2014 investigating the implications of reduced renal function and the nasolid adverse events, where they found that um, at a trough value um, of eight, a common 
trough value for patients who are taking linazolid at standard doses with reduced renal function, um, that there was a, about a 50% probability that the patient would develop thrombocytopenia, whereas a trough value um, of two has only about a 20% probability that the patient would develop thrombocytopenia. So what are these patient-specific uh, factors that can alter the lid exposure. Our first one is simply just being human. So a 2010 analysis of overall lid exposure in 90 patients admitted to either the ICU, the medical or surgical floors, who received standard lid dosing at 600 milligrams IV or PO every 12 hours exam examined if an extensive therapeutic drug monitoring program would be warranted um, in select patients. So we can see that this interpatient variability um, in the ranges of the C-mins that were collected from the patients. Uh, we can see that they range from 1.75 milligrams per liter all the way up to 7.53, so close to that eight milligram mark. Um, thus, it, that these patients who had an increased risk for, the, for developing thrombocytopenia. Um, they also found extreme overexposure, so defined as trough values that were greater than 10 milligrams per liter, was documented in about 12% of the patients. Uh, so even in a random cohort, there was about 10% of the patients there that were receiving exceedingly high doses of insulin. So the study concluded that therapeutic drug monitoring would be worthwhile in about 30% of patients in order to avoid either dose-dependent toxicity or reduce the transfer treatment failures. So the next factor is something that I already alluded to already, uh, which is renal dysfunction. So a 2017 assessment of the therapeutic drug monitoring program of linazolid, the ICU with medical patients who, again, were receiving standard dose linazolid at the 600 milligrams Q12 hours found that overexposure occurred more frequently in patients with reduced kidney function. So this was a 10-year retrospective study that included 1,049 patients who were all receiving therapeutic drug monitoring with linazolid. The authors assessed the risk for increased linazolid exposure by recording when a patient had a trough value of greater than seven. So we can see this as the odds ratio of a patient with a creatinine clearance less than 40 has a statistically significant increased risk of having a semen target above seven as compared to someone with, with just normal renal function. So somebody who has reduced renal function has um, higher odds of having seen the semen targets above seven and thus being at greater risk for thrombocytopenia. Ultimately, the authors concluded that in these patients with reduced kidney function, therapeutic drug monitoring may be beneficial to optimize linazolid exposure and decrease the risk for adverse events. So our last patient factor is whether or not patients are receiving hemodialysis. A 2006 study of the pharmacokinetics of linazolid compared differing exposures in ICU patients that either received or didn't receive hemodialysis. Um, so this was just a small group of patients um, were used in this study, but they collected uh, 222 measurements of linazolid levels across differing time points during dialysis. And the study found that in stage, the in end stage renal disease patients who were not on hemodialysis were at risk for toxicity due to increased semen values of linazolid, and that patients on hemodialysis were at risk for treatment failure with lower CNN values with um, and this can be seen here seen um, on the slide where patients with HD the minimum was at 1.48 which at that point we're getting concerned about treatment failure since we're not above the usual NIC value for a lot of the drugs that lit treats. They also found that hemodialysis patients had lower clearance rates of linazolid and had increased half-life times of the drugs um, when they were uh, without HD compared to with HD. So, so the conclusion was that patients who are on hemodialysis and taking linazolid have increased risk of treatment failure 
compared to those who are not on dialysis. Alrighty, so I've talked about some patient specific factors that can alter linasal exposure, uh, but let's really define about who are the patients that would most benefit from therapeutic drug monitoring. Uh, and simply stated, it's going to be the patients that are at greatest risk for toxicity. So those that have severe renal, um, severe renal dysfunction, uh, defined as a creatine clearance of less than 40, or who are um, uh, end-stage liver disease, either on or not on hemodialysis, if they have current signs of toxicity, or if they have baseline from cytopenia, defined as less than 100,000 plate, plate, platelets per microliter, some other possible patients that could be at increased risk are those that are on P-glycoprotein um, inhibitors, such as omeprazole or amiodarone. Um, however, the data is sparing in this area. So um, although it's something that we probably won't need to initiate therapeutic drug monitoring, um, it's important to closely monitor these patients um, as they are uh, most likely at an increased risk for thrombocytopenia. And finally, the last patient group um, are those who are on therapy for longer durations of time, uh, like for the treatment of uh, multidrug resistant tuberculosis, uh, which can be uh, months of therapy. And we can see here, um, looking more closely at the duration of therapy, we can see that the risk for thrombocytopenia at day 14 is about 50%. And this comes from the same. 2014 study mentioned before that investigated the implications of reduced renal function and lenase with adverse events. And although there is no consensus just yet on when uh, it's the best time to get a level for monitoring, um, we can see that as time goes on, the risk for thrombocytopenia increases dramatically. So it'd be best to get labs sooner rather than later. Um, and Really, the goal is to get them as soon as the nasal lid reaches steady state so that we can intervene as early as possible to ensure the patient's safety. Alrighty, and so our last objective, um, so we have identified which patients to monitor levels in based on patient specific factors. Um, and so now we can go in um, uh, what we can do to actually adjust the medication based on its drug levels. So linazolid is an AUC over MIC dependent killer. Therefore, higher exposures over longer periods of time will increase its killing power. So this poses a particular issue as thrombocytopenia, as mentioned before, is a dose dependent adverse reaction with which increases over um, which increases risk over time. So we can assess we, we can assess the exposure of linazolid with C min values with higher levels indicating a higher risk for thrombocytopenia occurrence. Now, because most strains of bacteria will have an MIC of around two, um, linazolid at standard dosing um, will most likely maintain semen levels above two, or corresponding to an EUC of about 180. So ultimately, we're more worried about the toxicity of linazolid um, rather than the lack of efficacy. And for the 2014 study assessing that risk of thrombocytopenia and linazolid exposure, um, a semen of eight will correlate with an increased risk of developing thrombocytopenia. Thus, our goal range that we're going to be shooting for is to maintain linazolid levels in between the goal range of two to eight. Um, utilizing trough monitoring. Alrighty, so how do we go about dose adjustments within the minutes lid? So regardless of the patient's individual factors, um, there just isn't enough evidence currently uh, to enforce an initial dose reduction solely based uh, on a patient's renal function. Therefore, all linazolid regimen should be initiated at a normal standard dose of 600 milligrams Q12 hours. Once we do start the therapeutic drug monitoring, um, unfortunately, it won't be as straightforward as vancomycin dosing, where if the level's high, we'll reduce the dose, or if it's low, we'll increase it. Um, any dosing changes should be carefully weighed against other factors, such as an AUC goal for a specific infection, 
um, the MIC is the bug that Renee's was treating, how far along the patient is in therapy, the severity of the infection, and if the patient is experiencing any signs of toxicity. All of these factors should be weighed against the potential effects that a dose reduction of linazolid may have, um, with that being um, a transfer uh, therapeutic failure of the linazolid. Um, and as always, with, with, with these um, antibiotic medications, dosing changes should be consulted with the infectious disease team beforehand. So if a dose change is warranted, um, a reduction in frequency of linazolid would be most beneficial um, as this would lower the serum trough value while still maintaining adequate AUC over MIC exposure. Um, if we reduce the dose and say go down to a 300 milligram Q12 hours, um, we run the risk of treatment failure as that will reduce the AUC more than just a single, um, rather than just a frequency adjustment. Um, and so the figure at the bottom of the slide, I think does a nice job of displaying um, what dose of linazolid could be used at a given creatinine clearance to achieve a target semen, and it can be helpful as a guide um, to select a reasonable uh, linazolid dose, um, but this shouldn't be followed uh, verbatim. And again, I just want to reiterate that just because we have a, a linazolid trough value might be slightly elevated, it does not automatically mean that we're going to a dose adjustment is warranted. We want to make sure that we keep in account all of the other factors that are going on with the patient's infection. So there's still much more research that needs to be done on this topic, uh, but I think with the available evidence, as well as a lot of other institutions instituting this therapeutic drug monitoring, uh, there's strong evidence that this can be very beneficial for patients um, who, are, who are receiving linazolid and can help keep them safe, especially for longer therapies um, that patients have. Thank you.